From the studios of the Optimism Institute, welcome to the Blue Sky Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Burke, and in every Blue Sky episode, we'll be speaking to leaders, researchers, and thinkers whose stories and insights will remind us that there is always blue sky above. Sometimes you just have to get your head above the clouds to see it. Like so many of the people who come on this show, today's Blue Sky guest, Theodore R. Johnson, who also goes by Ted, comes to us with a remarkable personal story. As you'll soon hear, he grew up with a wide range of experiences as a black man in the South. Living in a white neighborhood while attending a primarily black church three to four times a week exposed him to people with a wide range of backgrounds and worldviews. Following high school, Ted enrolled in and graduated from a historically black college before joining the Navy. What he thought would be four years in the Navy turned into 20 as Ted climbed the ranks to become a commander. He was also a White House fellow during President Obama's first term and later became a speechwriter for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. It was in this role that Ted discovered his love of writing. And today he's a columnist, essayist, and author of two books, the second of which is entitled If We Are Brave and was just published on October 1st of 2024. Ted is a contributing columnist to the Washington Post and his writing has also been featured in The Bulwark, The New York Times Magazine, The Atlantic, Wall Street Journal, and National Review. While much of Ted's work focuses on our country's ongoing challenge to combat racism and institutional barriers that prevent us from having a more equitable society, he approaches these efforts with a sense of optimism. Born from a belief that while our founders themselves were far from perfect, they left us with ideas and ideals that are worth believing in and fighting for. I hope you enjoy this Blue Sky conversation with Ted Johnson as much as I did. Ted Johnson, welcome to the Blue Sky Podcast. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. It's great to have you on. You're a remarkable person with an amazing background. Uh, We are going to get to your brand new book that uh, dropped yesterday, October 1st. But first, I'd like us to learn a little bit more about you, uh, your upbringing, how you came to the work that you're doing now. So could you tell us a little bit about where did you grow up and and how did your upbringing influence the work that you've done since? Yeah. So, you know, I grew up in North Carolina primarily. Uh, I'm a Gen X kid, born in 75. Uh, my parents were IBMers, uh, first generation college kids themselves. Um, both okay. of them grew up fairly poor in Jim Crow, Georgia and South Carolina, Uh, so for them to get middle-class jobs right out of college was a new experience, not just for them, but for sort of both sides of the family. Sure. Uh, and I was the first of four kids born into, into that, that union born in Maryland, spent a little bit of time in Poughkeepsie, New York, but grew up primarily in North Carolina. And, uh, that's what I consider home. Um, grew up, we were at church three times a week, sometimes four. So a lot of time in church. Uh, I did all the the things other kids do. I collected baseball cards and I like pro wrestling and, you know, uh, (laughs) uh, played sports. Um, uh, I grew up primarily in a white suburb in Raleigh. Uh, And so for much of my life, I did not live around black people. I was usually one of the only one or one of very few black kids in my friend group in the neighborhood. And, um, uh, but our church was was black, and so that was sort of my weekly, you know, <laughs> departure from regular America to a yeah. very, you know, a very niche section of it. And that describes life up until uh, I graduated high school, went off to an HBCU uh, in Virginia, and then off to the military, mostly as a way of um, sort of crossing the threshold into manhood, sort of testing my myself to see if I was ready to take on life as a, as a man independent of his parents, but also just wanting to have an interesting job that, sure. uh, you know, take me around the world a little bit and uh, life sort of picks up from there. Would you say there was something about that? I don't know if it's a full duality, but the, you, you mentioned sort of most of your week and then versus church. How did that influence your choice of an HBC to go to an HBCU, do you think? 
Yeah, it, it definitely influenced it. You know, my both of my parents are HBCU grads. They okay. both grew up again where they grew up. They were in segregated rural communities. So okay. their, their churches, their schools, you know, their lives were segregated. Um, but well, again, I, I was raised in a very integrated kind of place or, or desegregated place. I, I was raised right. uh, again in the suburbs. So my choice to go to an HBCU was mostly a financial one, to be honest okay. with you. I applied okay. to um, three HBCUs and then three, you know, uh, predominantly white institutions. And it was sort of what, whichever one gives me the best deal that would yep. cost my parents the least amount of money. That's yep. where we're going to school. And, gotcha. uh, and so that's how I landed at, at Hampton University. Um, but I, I, I will say that um, my parents' experience, positive experiences at their HBCU informed my decision sure. to apply to one in the first place and to, and to really entertain the idea of going. And the, I, I think the main reason of that is because they um, talked about those schools having a family atmosphere where professors cared if you came to class or not and sort of kept up with you. So I knew I wasn't quite ready to strike it out on my own at, at 18. So it's, yeah. it felt like a soft launch by going to a conservative, relatively conservative HBCU. So you went to Hampton University, which for those who don't know, is right there where the naval base is or right near it. That's right. And I'm wondering, before you went, were you thinking about the Navy or was, or was it that proximity? It's if I don't know, if, is Norfolk the biggest naval station in it the is, US? in the world. In the world. Yeah. Big and the Norfolk Naval Base, the biggest naval installation in the world. Okay, yeah, so did, did that was that yeah. an influence or w- tell us about that? You know, it wasn't. I, I have um, uncles that have served time okay. in the army or in the Air Force, um, none in the Navy, which is the, the route that I chose. Uh, and so I did apply to um, for a ROTC scholarship, okay, coming out of high school, yep. mostly because that meant college would be free. And so I could go to whatever school I got into and wouldn't have to worry about my, the hit on my my parents' pocket. Gotcha. Uh, but I didn't get a four-year ROTC scholarship, so that was out of the question. And I kind of forgot about the military, honestly. And then um, after, while I was a freshman in college, um, my parents got a new neighbor in North Carolina who happened to be the officer in charge of the Navy recruiting district <laughs> in Raleigh. Uh, okay. And so when they when she found out they had a kid in college <laughs> yeah. who was trying to figure out what he wanted to do with life, and as it turns out, um, this program that she uh, told my parents about was specifically created to diversify the officer corps in the Navy. I didn't know this at the time. I didn't find that out till ten years later. Interesting. But um, and so so. I was like uh, a, a little golden nugget in the neighborhood for her, um, <laughs> or for this this Navy program, and it was music to my ears. Uh, so I tested for it and 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 picked it up, and uh, and it was great. I, I was uh, easily the best decision I made between the ages of sixteen and 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 twenty two was uh, was going was choosing to go to the military. Yeah, and you weren't a quick in and out. Twenty years in the Navy. That's right. Yeah, you rose to be an officer. Yeah, it was going to be four. I, I left Hampton, went to Officer Candidate School in Pensacola, um, did a few months there, graduated, went to San Diego, and I was going to do that tour, do those three years, um, get a second job in the military, leave after four, do reserves for four, and hopefully just have a government job somewhere in the D.C. area and live happily ever after. Um, and then uh, I got to D.C. or to the um, D.C. area on my second tour and then ended up getting an early promotion and the chance to go overseas. And that was, uh, that's sort of what um, kept me in. And at that point, you know, I'm at the eight year mark going on 11 at the time I'll leave my third duty station. And once you cross the 10 year mark, you're halfway to retirement. So it just made sense to stick around. So the four year uh, side quest turned into a, a 20 year career. Amazing. And again, it was, it was amazing. Yeah. And, and eventually you become speechwriter for the chairman of the joint chiefs. Was that, was that flowing right from that or did you do other things in between? Yeah, it's so interesting. I mean, I, I was in the Navy, spent, but spent 10 years of my life in the DC area. Uh, so I spent more, I spent more time in the Pentagon than I have at sea when you add up all the time together. Yeah. So my first three years I was at sea riding ships out of San Diego, going to the Arabian Gulf and, and enforcing UN sanctions against Saddam Hussein and oil smuggling and that sort of thing. Wow. And then from there, I went to the National Security Agency for a few years um, during the time of the okay. uh, enduring freedom and, and the Iraqi freedom wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. And then from there to Okinawa, Japan for just over two years. And then to the Naval War College um, for a few years in Rhode Island. And then to the um, and then in 2011, I got picked up for the White House Fellowship, where you spend a year. Uh, in this fellowship in DC, and I never left. I spent a year at the White House Fellowship, 
went from there to the Pentagon and spent about uh, just under three years working on operations stuff. And then the last 18 months of my career as a um, speechwriter to uh, first uh, Chairman Dempsey and sure. then to Chairman Dunford uh, before retiring in the summer of 16. So wow. speechwriting was, it was, um, I was actually in school at the same time. This was sort of the end of my career. So I was getting a doctorate and knew I wanted to pivot away from the cyber stuff I worked in the military. And so speech writing turned out to be just a great way to, um, a, a great complement to my doctoral pursuits outside of work. So I was writing everywhere at work for different audiences and school for academics. And that doing, trying to cultivate those two skills at the same time is where I recognize writing is what I want to do. And I want to do it from sort of a, an informed research pers perspective. Uh, so that's sort of the, the speech writing helped uh, usher my career from the military into the post-military life. You, you mentioned getting a doctorate. A lot of people, who, if they, you don't have experience with the military, I don't have personal experience, but a lot of family, the amount of education, continuing education you get when you're in the military and you don't, you don't become an officer and an admiral and a general or you know, whichever branch you're in without that continuing education is remarkable. Yeah. Yeah. They really do invest in these benchmark um, degrees or um, exposures, you know, training sessions. Um, yeah. You're a lifelong learner if you're in the military and it, you, you need to be in order to be promotable. Ted Johnson's immediate family came a very long way from his parents growing up poor in the Jim Crow South to their son's remarkable accomplishments at the highest levels of the U.S. military and government. It's interesting to think about what Ted's childhood must have been like growing up in a white suburb while also being deeply involved in a black church. After attending Hampton University, he thrived in the Navy, and as opportunities kept coming his way, he didn't wind up retiring until he'd made it to 20 years of service. Getting back to our conversation, I wanted Ted to talk about his writing career. So you, you find the love for writing. You're clearly good at it. You've got the bug. And a lot of the writing you've done and the two books we're going to talk about, the one you've already published and the one that's about to come out, the first one that's, that's been published, When the Stars Begin to Fall, Overcoming Racism and Renewing the Promise of America. So you have chosen, and your next book, I believe, sort of picks up on some of these themes, You've chosen to write about racism in America and from an angle where, and you correct me, but it feels like you're saying this is sort of, you know, an original sin of this country. It's one of our biggest issues, but you come at it with a sense of optimism in that we are founded on the belief that we can be better. And, you know, you're renewing the promise of America is in the title of your book. Is that a fair way of describing? And could you just tell us, and then how did you arrive on this was a subject you wanted to specialize in? Yeah, again, I think that that captures the, the first book uh, really well. I actually, my, my work generally pretty well. Um, I'll tell you, it was the year that I spent as a White House fellow in 11, 12. 2012 was the year that Trayvon Martin was killed. Uh, and I've got three sons, you know, uh, black boys, dreadlocks and uh, darker skin. Uh, and so um, while... I loved the military service. I was tired of moving every so you know every two, three, four years, and I wanted to sort of put roots down somewhere. Um, the work that I was doing was more. There was more oversight the further we got away from war, which is a good thing. But it meant that we did lots of planning and lots of talking and meetings and travel to <laughs> that resulted in no operations. Uh, so that became frustrating. And then I was yep. just less interested in what other nations were doing in cyberspace and more interested, again, after Trayvon Martin was killed, about just what kind of country uh, we were, we were going to have and what kind of nation I was going to leave to my kids. And so I wanted to focus my efforts on strengthening America from the inside uh, instead of sort of being at the on the front lines or, or at least in, in the service and trying to protect it from external enemies. So um, the, that's sort of how I came to the race conversation, because I, I wanted to know um, how could my kids live in the kind of America that we mythologize and not the America that's, you, you know, that has had a, a little bit of a struggle um, living up to its promise? So th and that's that's directed my research and, and pushed me um, from focusing on cyber stuff in the military to thinking more about race and participatory democracy. Be because of your upbringing and then the time in the Navy, I'm, I'm curious about this. The military in this country uh, sometimes gets criticized, but often gets credit 
for being better than other institutions in terms of integrating. You know, f- it's it's forced. You've got to get along. You know, my my late father grew up in, mostly in Vermont and uh, upstate New York. First shook hands with a black person at basic training for Korea. Mm, right. And partly because of that, he was a real advocate for, you know, mandatory service of some kind, maybe not military. And that, that, that the military – when there was a draft, <laughs> was one of the few places that really pushed people together. Can you give us a sense of what you saw in the Navy versus civilian life in terms of racism and how race was dealt with? Yeah, I mean, the military is a microcosm of the broader society. So, um, uh, but, but I think what the military does much better than almost anywhere else in society, except maybe public school, is to put, and I think it does this better than public school, actually, is to put people from different places um, in a place together where their success and sometimes their very lives are dependent on people that don't look like them, that didn't grow up like them. Right. And so it, it doesn't, it's not that it sort of microwaves brotherhood and kinship and solidarity. It's the exposure to people in ways that don't prime the thing that makes you different. So you, the, yes. you're primed because you're all in the same uniform to believe that you're pretty much all on the same team. You want the same things out of life. Yes. You're not each other's enemy. And so differences in religion or what region you're from or the color of your skin or your ethnicity become less important uh, in, in sort of overall because you're all in, in the unit together or you're sort of all working towards the same task. And that exposure under these constructive circumstances is what cultivates the the kind of solidarity I think we, we want to see in the broader society. The last thing I'll say on this, though, is um, what research has shown from World War II forward is that all of the benefits gained from being exposed to people who are different from you, different politics, et cetera, when you are removed from that environment, say you leave the military and go back to your home community, it only takes uh, a, a year or two to readapt the values of the place where you came from. Yep and begin to lose the practices and exercises, beliefs and stuff of where you were. So there's a radius and a half-life to the positive effects of, of, a, of connection that military provides. If it's not cultivated, if it's not um, exercised and, and cared for, then it atrophies and eventually, you, you know, you can get some negative results. Out of it. In, in the broad topic of, of racism in America, one of the saddest chapters I've come across in just my reading, I didn't live it, was African American troops coming back after World War II and having, you know, been shot at and and many died and coming back, even wearing uniform and coming back to the exact same stuff that was yeah. there before they left. Um, yeah. So so one of the blurbs on your first book I really liked. It's from Mitch Landrew, and he said, "In this work, he that's you, Ted, <laughs> he challenges America <laughs> to find her better self, precisely because he loves her so much." Mm. why do you love America so much? Yeah, it's, it's like asking, why do you love your family so much? You know, it's, it's like, this is where I was born. It is the world I was born into. And fortunately, I was born into a, a, a time in the nation far better than it was 100 years ago, 200 years ago. If I was born in, you know, 1875 instead of 1975 or 1775 instead of 1975, very different existence simply by because of the color of my skin. Uh, and so I, I love the country so much because of its sort of promise, its belief in democracy and equality. Um, I love it because others have fought so hard for me to have a place in it and for those who, who will come after. Um, and because it's, um, it, it's, you know, it's sort of cliche to say, but it is a place that was uh, founded on an idea, even when that idea was not executed to perfection and, and may never be to perfection, but the idea of, of equality and of democracy and that people should be basically reap the rewards of the, the work they put in, I buy into all of that. Um, so, so America is home. I love it because it's mine. <laughs> and and uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it's, there's, it's not even a question for me. It's always a question of how do we make it better, not, not how do we um, get rid of it or how do we do it uh, change it completely. It's interesting to hear Ted's take on the military's ability to integrate people with different backgrounds and ethnicities. He says that there, you're exposed to people in ways that don't prime the way you're different. 
And despite our many challenges as a country, many about which Ted himself writes, he still loves America and remains optimistic about our future. More than anything, he buys into what he calls the idea of America and embraces the challenge of thinking about how we might make it better. Now, back to my Blue Sky conversation with Ted Johnson. You mentioned the uh, Trayvon Martin shooting as being a sort of a catalyzing event for you. And now we're going on, hard to believe, 12 years since then. Um, I don't know how old your your kids were, if you'd had, you know, quote unquote, the talk before then or after. How do you feel about, you're still writing on this subject, how do you feel we've done in the 12 years since that, that event? There have been, sadly, even more high profile killings since then. How do you feel we're doing? Yeah, it's, you know, it's a hard question. It's hard to say that we're doing better. Um, right. Because it's still happening, and right. um, but I, I do think we're we, we're having more honest conversations about things when they do happen, and yes. those conversations aren't really leading to policy change. Maybe little thing, uh, you know, things here and yeah. there. Some some are big, like uh, you know, police wearing body cameras and that sort of thing. That yes. that matters, but it doesn't yes. stop the you know the the things from occurring at all. Which is what, yes. we, the, which is sort of the end goal. So, but where I think we we've gotten better on is now we can have honest, more honest public conversations about what's happening, where people are willing to listen to the role of race or maybe the abuse of power by state agents, in ways that they weren't willing to listen to two decades ago, and so it, it's almost unfortunate that the the um, very public nature of these killings, especially between black men and um, and armed policemen. Is, uh, yes. is that the, it has created a conversation that is more uh, expansive and, uh, and uh, I think more honest than, um, w- with more people than it was two or three decades ago. No doubt. I, it, I, I would agree with you. We also, I think, though, sort of thrash around as, as a country. I think about DEI. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah. I first heard the term, I was on a, a hospital board and it was after uh, George Floyd and you know we we had always talked about diversity but the EI part wasn't and so it was a huge push for so many organizations people got behind it and it hasn't been that long since then where pendulum starts swinging back and people start pulling back and if you're a person of color and you're in your job you're quote unquote DEI hire where do you come out, Ted, as someone who has studied this, lived this, writes about these general subjects? Where do you come out on this whole sort of, you know, DEI is the term. Right. Can you talk about that? Yeah, it's, you know, it's a term that's been hijacked and weaponized and, and turned into yeah. a political, um, you know, political tool instead of talking about what the, the actual objectives are. But it's not new. I mean, it's, it's political correctness, and then it was woke, yep. and now it's DEI. Yep. It's a, you know, out in the military, um, my, I've told you I had an early promotion. Someone told me they they said that I was an affirmative action promotion. You know, and, the, right. and so so that's just like saying today, oh, you're the DEI promotion, you're the DEI candidate. Right. You know, right? So it's always been it, there. right. So it's it's not new. It's just that the terminology is is a little different. Um, but what I'm most fascinated by is the impulse. Like w- why? Like, why is it effective to say that, um, to divide people based on a, an attempt to remediate things that the government got wrong? But the, the way I characterize racism writ large, and in, in not the interpersonal kind, but sort of the structural systemic, I think of it as an issue between the state and the public, not between black and white people or people of different races. So w- and during slavery, the state, the United States failed the people. It wasn't black, like white people hating black people, and the state just went along with it. Um, during Jim Crow, the state failed the people, uh, and so in this way, the the, the the focus of our efforts should be correcting the state's errors instead of trying to remediate or or change people's hearts and minds. Uh, that's the work of pastors and and psychologists and therapists and stuff uh, for in the policy world and sort of being good neighbors. Is just to ensure we all work under a set of just laws and and um, set of fair norms, uh, and get you know, and sort of able to get along in this big diverse society together. Uh, but as soon as someone's a DEI hire or an affirmative action, or they took my job, or they're ruining my community, 
it starts to um, divide the people that can hold government accountable. And it essentially weakens the people's voice by turning our voices uh, against one another yes. instead of sort of pulling them together and making demands of the state, which is what, you know, what the Declaration of the Constitution are, are drafted in order to facilitate. Fascinating. Okay, so I, I want to push this a little bit because you just said some really interesting things about this being the government failing the people. So a lot of people listening to this, probably the vast majority, or at least majority, don't work in the government. Mm -hmm. So let's say you're, you're listening to this and you run a business or you're a senior person at a business or up and coming in a business, whatever. What role do individual entities play if I'm running a, a hospital or I'm running, how, do, how would you advise or what's your belief on how those people should think about these issues? Because the government is, is wherever it is today. How, how would you think about building an organization with this lens? Yeah, I, you know, and I'm not a, um, I'm not a CEO. I'm not a, you know, an organizational leader. But my general sense of it uh, is that your companies should look like the people you serve, yep. or the people you sell to, or you know, yep. your consumers, your voters, your constituents, you know, your patients, your students. Yep. Um, the institution should reflect the the public that they serve. And so to the extent, you know, if it's more difficult to hire people of a certain gender or with certain language skills or certain races, ethnicities, um, because of where you're located or, or um, you know, education requirements or pay issues, yep. um, I think institutions, corporations that are most interested in doing the most good and, and offering the best product should take extra steps to ensure that their corporations or, again, their their people look like the public that they're trying to, to serve. And it, you, you do that because there are just cultural, there's cultural intelligence, there's a sort of gender intelligence, like I'm not the person to design, you know, what a woman's bathroom should look like. You know, <laughs> right. and, and it's right. not that I'm incapable, but right. there's this an experiential factor that I don't have that right. they do, which maybe it means we should have women on our team if we're going to be in the business of designing bathrooms. And so if that means you have to, 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 work harder to hire women and you have to pay them a little more to retain good talent, so be it because the product is better on the, on the other side anyway. Uh, instead of the model of like hire the people you're most comfortable working with right. and then shoving bad product down people's throats and then saying, well, this is the only one on the market. So yeah, you know, take it or leave it, right. but it's not our problem to fix it. Right. Uh, so that's, that's sort of how I see it. You know, uh, institutions that, that look like they're public, um, are able to tailor their product to that public, and that makes everything more uh, around, the whole thing more effective and more efficient. Such a simple but right way to put it, I think. <laughs> and you know, and mm, and this so, uh, yeah. you mentioned affirmative action, and I this podcast is generally a sort of politics free zone, election free zone. Mm. But I have to right. I have to dip into something where one thing that happened, I think, particularly after George Floyd at least for me personally, extremely privileged white guy, was understanding that. And privilege is another one of those words that's been misappropriated. But but mm -hmm. stopping mm -hmm. to understand the breaks that I've had and really understand them and really appreciate them. And I'll just say who said it. It was Michelle Obama uh, at a recent convention. Mm -hmm. And she talked, she used the phrase, and I'll get this mostly right, I think, the, the affirmative action of generational wealth. Right. And it was such a smart way to put it, I thought, because so many of us, I will talk about, I'll speak for white people. <laughs> so many, so many people <laughs> of privilege have, oh, DEI hire, oh, affirmative action. It's like, wait a second, didn't your old man go to this college? Exactly. You know, didn't, it's right. like, can we just acknowledge that a lot of us got all kinds of breaks that didn't fall under the traditional affirmative action umbrella, but that's kind of what that's they right. were. And I think the right. more we can do that on all sides of these issues, just say, you know what, time out. You know what? Yeah, I worked really hard. That's part of how I got ahead. But I was way ahead of the game because of the affirmative action that I experienced. Does that ring true to you? No, I think so. It's like, it's only affirmative action when it doesn't happen to you. You know, if, it's, <laughs> if you got in because of nepotism, right. well, that's not affirmative action. Right. You know, that's just having a good network. If you got in because you're a great handball player right. or, you know, you row well, well, that's not affirmative action. That's because I have an athletic talent. So it's, it's only affirmative action when it's the thing they can't achieve, which is like a, a historical experience attached to your race or, right. or gender or ethnicity. Um, and it's, it's not wrong when, in my view, when institutions try to, to correct that. 
Um, and so it's interesting um, if you, I, I know this is politics free zone, but the, the counter maxim to, to Obama's sort of, you know, the affirmative action of generational wealth yeah. is George Bush's, the soft bigotry of low expectations. Yes. You know, and so it's sort of, it's, well, if they just work harder, if we just expected more of our kids, then they'll meet that standard. And, and so it's, it's, it's the same issue that, that the two sides are talking about, but the framing of it is completely different yes. and the framing of it matters a lot. And that's frankly where I spend a lot of my, my, my writing on race and democracy. It's not to try to convert people on whether the United States is, is evil or genuinely good. It's just sort of, there's a set of realities in the world. And if we really want to live up to the promise of our country, we have to address the parts of our reality that prevent us from doing so. And race, in my view, is if you want to know where the United States is failing most, even if we're doing better relatively than most other nations, find out where the largest disparities are on, on a racial dimension, right. whether it's class or housing or you know military service, whatever it is. If there's a massive racial disparity, then there's probably a, a structural social issue. Yes. That needs to be addressed, and race is an indicator of it. Instead of racism being the driver of every disparity that we see, I, I just don't see it that way. I, I see it more as a sort of a, a, a faulty system that produces disparate results that needs correcting. Instead of a faulty people with you know um, evil views of each other that that need to be you know fenced in or, or better constrained. It's it's a really interesting distinction from the way a lot of people talk about this subject I think Ted and I think too it gives an opportunity to not have everybody start the conversation on the defensive. Right. Right. As individuals. Absolutely. And or it's you know you know we have great founding documents but Thomas Jefferson had slaves it's like okay 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 but let's let's talk about the founding documents let's talk about what this country is supposed to be and continue to try to form a more perfect union. And, I, and my sense is that's kind of what drives your work. That's right. Yeah, we, you know, we can take the founders' ideas or the systems they set up and, and try to improve on them or perfect them. We don't have to model our lives after the founders themselves. So if, you know, <laughs> right. if, a, if a slave owner <laughs> wrote the words, all men are created equal, all men being created equal can still be a valid, just concept without deifying the, the person who wrote it. And unfortunately, what happens in a lot of the, the way we tell the narrative of our, of our nation, it is that the men were so great that their ideas came out the way they did. And so you have to deify the man in order to accept the premise that the idea is beautiful. And I'm saying, no, you don't. And history suggests, no, you don't. Uh, that once ideas are put out into the world, they, you no longer have ownership of them. And, uh, and I, I don't think any American alive um, should think that emulating the founders to the nth degree today is the way to ensure perfection tomorrow. Um, but taking the ideas that they, they codified in the Declaration and in the Constitution and, and so forth, uh, and then trying to make them make those laws, though that, that, that's sort of instructions on, on how government works, apply to our challenges today yeah. and solve it for us and posterity and, right. instead of... Um, you know, trying to recapture some some former glory of flawed people. Yeah, deeply flawed men could still have left us with great ideals. Absolutely, that's <laughs> and right. That's, and right. that, it seems, is what you, you embraced. In the time since the killings of Trayvon Green, George Floyd, and too many others, Ted knows we still have a very long way to go but is heartened by his belief that we at least are having more honest conversations about race and related societal challenges than we used to. And I was interested to hear Ted's belief that our efforts should be directed primarily at our government and policies that are getting in the way of solutions. He says our issues are less about faulty people and more about faulty systems. Getting back to our conversation, we'll now talk about Ted's latest book, so I talked about your first book. Let's talk about the one that's uh, just being released this week, uh, If We Are Brave. Tell us about uh, the book, how it came about, what you're, what you're trying to accomplish, what, what we can expect from this new book. Yeah, it's If We Are Brave, Essays from Black Americana. And um, what it really tries to do is have the national conversation on race from the perspective of like this Black dude from the South, <laughs> from the military, from HBCUs, from the Black church. 
you know, this person with a set of experiences who's approaching the conversation on race in America from a place of optimism, mm. uh, a place of pragmatism, and uh, even a, pla- a place of patriotism, but also being very honest and realistic about what it is like to be Black in America, even in the places where we think we've rubbed out most of racism, w- racism's worst effects, like yes. in universities, in, in the military. So it's an essay collection. It's, it's eight essays. Um, a couple of those essays have been published before. One has been published, or actually one big essay has been uh, published in the New York Times Magazine on sort of democracy and Black senators and Black voters voting so heavily for one party o- over another since, really since the 1870s. Yes. Um, and then there's another essay in there that I wrote after George Floyd's murder, but I wrote it for National Review, which is a very conservative sure, magazine. Yeah. So it was an article about race, but making the argument that um, police reform needs to happen um, to a conservative libertarian audience instead of to sort of a, a broader public. And then there are other essays that, you know, talk about experiences in the military that are uh, reflections on, you know, old arguments or older arguments from Du Bois, not old arguments, they're still very good ones, but uh, from folks like Du Bois and Richard Wright and, yeah. and uh, Booker T. Washington. And then, and then some are just sort of unpacking, you know, when we say we believe in democracy, what does that really mean? Yes. And uh, what, does, what does race sort of teach us about how to think about it? So you mentioned before, I think, part of your optimism coming from the fact that it was better to be born the year you were born than 100 years <laughs> right. prior. Where else, if anywhere, <laughs> does your optimism come from? Because it could be very I, – I had the privilege of meeting and then later having on my show Latasha Brown – of Black Voters Matter, just a really incredible person. And she's talking to us about these really challenging things, but like with this smile on her face. And I, I finally said, how, how are you so optimistic? And one of the first things she said, she said, I'm the product of optimism. Yes. I, if it weren't for my parents' optimism and I, is that, does that, you're not, you're nodding yep. your head. Does uh, that resonate percent. with you? <laughs> it does. One, a hundred percent, you know, I have, given the, the life that I've lived, um, who am I to be pessimistic about the future of the country when the folks that are responsible for me being here under much worse circumstances still manage to hold out hope that would, life would be better for their, their kids or their grandkids? Right. I mean, my name is Theodore Roosevelt Johnson III, which means my grandfather was named after Teddy Roosevelt. Your grandfather? And he was, yeah, my grandfather in 1918, uh, I think it was the year after Roosevelt died or the year he died, something like that. Yeah. Um, because Roosevelt, one of the first acts he did after becoming president was to invite Booker T. Washington, a black exactly. man, to Huge dine with the deal. first family. It was a big deal. Huge and deal. And so my, my great-grandparents named my grandfather after the president. So that's like, if they had enough faith to believe maybe one day, wow. you know, we, we, are, we will be so audacious as to name our poor black baby in deep South, South Carolina in 1918, after the sitting rich millionaire <laughs> pre- president from New York, um, because th- the equality symbolized at that dinner is something we believe will, will one day be attained, was worth marking, you know, all, on our son's birth certificate and on, on his being. Uh, and so, and I've, you know, I've met president Obama, I've met president Clinton and Bush and uh, I've met Kamala Harris. I, like it, the journey of my name requires a belief in, in the, in, in sort of promise of the country. Um, it's just too core to, to my family story here. So I, I absolutely agree with her. I get it. I'm the product of optimism and I absolutely intend to pass it on. Uh, and then the second part of this is I, I, I'm not going anywhere. Uh, I was born here. I'm yeah. God willing, I'll die here. Yeah, uh, yeah. And so I, I believe that this place I call home can be better. And, um, and, and I believe in the promise of the country. I believe that even if we never become the more perfect union, we can leave it better when we are gone than it was when we arrived. And, uh, and that requires just a, an optimistic outlook that you can have success, that your, your values, that your, your belief system is worthy of uh, being the foundation for your work and the way you live your life. I am so glad you told me what the R stands for. So I've been calling you Ted. People looking for your book, which they should. 
uh, you go by Theodore R, I believe, on the cover of the book. Right. I did not know the R was exactly. Roosevelt, and I'm so glad you brought that That's up. That's right. And because I share a love of history, and it and it drives a lot of my optimism. And uh, my my listeners will roll their eyes as I say this because they know what's coming. One of my favorite quotes. A guy named Kevin Kelly was on my show, and he's written a terrific book. And he says, if you only read the news, you'll think things have never been worse. But if you read history, you'll realize things have never been better. Mm. And it stayed with me. And, and you've described it a couple of times that as mm. tough as things are, it's better than if you'd been born 100 years ago. And are, are yeah. your parents still alive, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, my father is. My mother passed away. It's been just over three years now. Okay. Um, and they are, I mean, the, the house that I grew up in is still where, that's where my mom lived until her last days. My dad is still there. So I can imagine what your dad feels when he sees your book in the bookstore. Yeah, it's something. My, it, my, my mom um, passed away the month before my first book was on shelves. Oh, I'm so sorry. But I received oh. early advanced copies of the hardcover and sent her one. Oh. And the day she went oh. to the hospital for the last time, that morning, oh. my book had arrived by FedEx, so she got the hold one, uh, even though it wasn't uh, w- wasn't on shelf. She never got to see this one come come to life. But I think her right. and her mother on the inside dedication uh, for the love of reading and writing and uh, being appreciative of the Black cultural experience, as well as the um, believing that the, you know we can make the most of ourselves here in the United States. It was music to my ears to hear Ted say he's trying to approach our challenges around race from a place of optimism, pragmatism, and patriotism. And I was really struck when he said, who am I to be pessimistic about this country? And as a history buff and fan of Teddy Roosevelt, you are likely able to hear just how blown away I was by the story of his great-grandparents naming their son Theodore Roosevelt Johnson after President Roosevelt had invited Booker T. Washington to dine at the White House. Amazing. And now to my final segment with Ted Johnson. We've talked a lot about you as an individual and your work. You lead New America's flagship us at 250. Can you tell us about New America? A lot of people probably aren't familiar with it, why you're there, why it's appealing to you, and also about this us at, at 250 initiative. Sure thing. Yeah. So New America is a, a think and do tank. And, and DC, as uh, our, our president Emery likes to say, um, it's, really, it's really a think tank that thinks about the evolution of the country as things like technology, family structure, the economy, the labor force, as these things evolve. Do we have the policy, the sort of social contract in place to keep pace with the evolution of our society? Uh, and what, what we find in New America and what, what folks are, find everywhere is that often our policy lags behind the social evolutions happening in the country. And closing that gap is, is, uh, is an important task. So a lot of the work New America does is trying to update, update the nation's systems and our, our approach to policy to account for the world as it is instead of dragging in old structures to apply to, to the world today. And so what we're doing at us at 250, the country will turn 250 years old in July of 2026. That's the, the date the Declaration of Independence was, uh, will yes. turn 250 to the, the sign, the ratification of that. And so we want to mark the, um, the semi quincentennial by highlighting the work of folks and communities ac- across the country that are bridging people across their differences, uh, over divides, over history or place in society, demography, political power, that sort of thing but leaning into the, I, the concepts of pride, reckoning, and aspiration. Hmm. Pride in the nation's progress since its uh, inception, reckoning with its shortfalls, both historical and contemporary, and then aspiring to a shared vision of the country that has room for all of us and uh, you know, fair processes to, to deliberate over our, our disputes. Um, so we're, we're, we're in our second class of fellows. We've got a total of 30 fellows now. This class are local journalists covering stories from uh, Seattle and LA through Colorado, Nebraska, Illinois, all the way up and down the East Coast. And um, they're doing some long form journalism that we'll be putting out over the next year or so to, to cover success stories or, or tough stories from communities across the country that are trying to grapple with 
you know, the, the, the diverse, the, the problems that diverse societies often present. I love it. So you're making me feel old because I was born in 66. And so uh, I remember the bicentennial right. very clearly. <laughs> it was a huge deal. And what did you yeah. call, what is it? 250? What'd you call it's it? The, yep. The semi quincentennial. So the centennial, <laughs> that's a hundred. Quincentennial yeah. is 500. And then the semi cut that in half. Semi quincentennial is 250. We're going to have uh, to work at that. Bicentennial like the- <laughs> rolled off the tongue a little more easily. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, this is, it's do a Gen Z intervention. I um, mean, the 250 <laughs> is a quarter of a millennium. So like quarter milli or something would have been worked just milli. as well as <laughs> semi-quincentennial, but. I love longer. it. <laughs> and so, so if we are brave, I suppose, could fold into this. And and I'd like mm-hmm. to go back to that and, and we we can wrap up with just sort of what, what do you hope people, when they rush out and buy this book, which I hope they will, mm-hmm. um, what do you hope a reader will take from this? Of, of all of all backgrounds, you know, who read this book and they put it down, how do you hope they think differently, feel differently about this country, about the subject you write about? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I really want readers to be able to step into uh, the shoes of a Black man for 40,000 words. And not to say that my experience is character, you know, is um, the, the the archetype for like the black experience. Like yeah. it's not just my my experience does not um, typify all of right. them. But a lot of times, conversations we have about racism are complicated by the fact that we don't understand the other person's point of view. And so, what I try to do here is engage in very big ideas that we're all familiar with: d- democracy and elections and police brutality and affirmative action. But do it from the point of view like th- uh, of how um, a person with my background thinks about these issues and hopes that we can actually resolve them to move forward. And so it's not a, a rant. It's not a policy recommendation. It's not angry, but it is very honest and, um, and doesn't pull any punches. And so in the same way that, you know, white families in the 80s watched The Cosby Show. Yeah. Um, sure, it was funny and entertaining, but it was also interesting to see is this what happens inside of a black house? Right. Especially if you're from Iowa or somewhere yeah. and have never been into a black person's home. And so in a way, I hope to like walk people into this life experience in a way that once they leave it, they say, oh, now when people say, you know, um, you know, police are racist, I have a sense of what that means. Not, it's not what I thought it meant. Yes. This is what they're saying. Yes. And I understand it better now because I, I took the journey with Ted to get there. Well, I have not read the book yet, and I can't wait to. And I encourage everyone to get out and buy it. And I, I it's tell good. you, I, I promise it's good. I'm sure it is. <laughs> and, and, I'll, and I don't want this to sound too trite, but just as your your parents and grandparents would be proud of you, it's it's an interesting thought to think about what Theodore Roosevelt would think about mm. you being named for him as an outcropping of or an outcome of his having Booker T. Washington at the White House. It's an incredible story. And yeah. so I'm so glad you shared it uh, with me and with our audience. And so uh, Theodore R. Ted Johnson, thank you so much for being on this show. Best of luck thank with you. your book, If We Are Brave. I know it's going to do great, and uh, I look forward to reading it. Thanks so much. Thank you. Very much appreciate it. Ted Johnson is a remarkable person. And after speaking with him, I'm pleased to know that at New America, he's involved in their efforts to help us all celebrate the 250th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And I think they've hit on three great ways for us to look back on our history with pride, with reckoning, and with aspiration. And we have a little less than two years now to get used to saying semi-quincentennial. I hope you enjoyed this Blue Sky conversation with Ted Johnson and that you'll check out his new book, If We Are Brave. And before you go, please take a minute to leave us a rating or review. These help us keep making our shows better and they make it easier for new listeners to find us. While you're at it, you might want to subscribe to Blue Sky wherever you get your podcasts. Sign up for the Blue Sky Weekend newsletter at theoptimisminstitute.com and follow us on social media. This and all Blue Sky episodes are made possible by the incredible editing and mixing done by the team at Sound On Studios. 
You can learn more about their work at soundonstudios.com. All graphic design and cover art for Blue Sky and the Optimism Institute are provided by Crush Graphics, and that's Crush with a K. If you'd like to check out more of their fantastic work at crushgraphics.com. Until next time, I'm the founder of the Optimism Institute and host of Blue Sky, Bill Burke, and I thank you for listening.